Thank you. So, I never aspired to be in Playboy. But at the age of 52, I got the call. Guess what, Mom? I'm going to be in Playboy. It was an article <laughs> about actress and singer Demi Lovato, who again found herself in the public eye because of an apparent overdose. So I don't have the privilege of knowing Ms. Lovato, but as a professor and psychologist at UT Health San Antonio, every day of every year my life revolves around opioids. And it is my life's work to fight for those struggling with addiction. And that is why I was in Playboy. So fortunately, Ms. Lovato reports that she is actively engaged in treatment. But in 2016, there were 42,000 opioid-related overdose deaths. That is 115 overdose deaths every day, one every eight minutes. And without treatment, many more will die. So the opioid crisis began for me personally uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, where I worked at McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And there was a detoxification unit where I was working. And on the board was a whiteboard. And there were the names, first names of the patients, the date of admission, and the reason for admission. And this gave the staff all the essential information that they needed for that day. And typically, the reason for use on that board was alcohol or heroin. And then one day, I was looking at the board, and I noticed something different. It was OxyContin. And that is a powerful pain medication. And as more and more OxyContin patients came in, there was one day when I noticed that the only medication on that board was OxyContin. Welcome to the opioid crisis, circa 2003. So opioids can be complicated. For example, there are many different kinds of opioids. There are illegal opioids, like heroin, and there are legal opioids, like the medication OxyContin. And some people use them for pleasure, and some use them for pain, and some people use them for both. And the fact is, we really don't know who will or will, know on, who will, or will not go on to develop a problem with opioid use, because many people can try them and not go on to develop a problem. Maybe it's genetics. Maybe it's environment. Probably it's a combination of both. The science just isn't there yet. But regardless of why, the number of deaths in this country is staggering. Right now, opioid-related fatalities account for as many deaths each year as firearms and exceed deaths from motor vehicle accidents. And there are three barriers that get in the way of ending the opioid crisis. Access, affordability, and our attitudes. The first barrier is access. Right now, there is simply not enough high-quality, evidence-based treatment in the United States. Evidence-based treatment means treatment that has been demonstrated scientifically to work. People with addiction often wait days, weeks, or even months to find access to high-quality care. And that is simply not acceptable. We need treatment on demand. What that means is that when someone is ready for help, that help is available. Because nobody should have to wait weeks to find high-quality care. The second barrier is affordability. Even if someone can find access to high-quality care, it is not always affordable. The costs add up. It can cost tens of thousands of dollars to get good care. And that is not always covered by insurance, if the person even has health insurance. And the last barrier, and arguably the most important, is our attitudes about addiction and its treatment. For many of us, Addiction is an issue of character, a weakness. Addiction is not a character flaw. Why 
why can't they just stop using, we say? Well, addiction is not a choice. In reality, addiction is a disease, and it has been recognized as such by the American Medical Association for a very long time. Left untreated, just like diabetes and asthma and, and heart disease, the prognosis is not good. We can't just wish it away. Our attitudes about addiction and its treatment make treatment even harder to find for those struggling. And for those who are asking for help, they find it even harder to ask for help. Our attitudes are a barrier to treatment. In the words of the director of the Center for Disease Control, stigma is the enemy of public health. The current issues we are facing in this country represent the greatest public health failure of our time. And that is why I met Deb de la Garza in August of 2016, when she asked me to participate in the first San Antonio, Texas Overdose Awareness Day. But I never had the opportunity to meet her son, Manuel, 18. I am tired of parents holding pictures of their dead children. In the time that I have spoken, what parent has lost their child to a preventable opioid-related fatality? And who out there is in a desperate struggle for their lives? One, every eight minutes. I need your help. because there came a moment in my own life when I realized that I couldn't save my child by myself. And in truth, I can't protect yours. Ending this requires all of us. In the midst of the current opioid crisis, it is time for us to pause and consider our own shared responsibility for lives lost, families devastated, and communities left ravaged. Our fundamental misunderstanding of opioid use disorder is a barrier to effective treatment because it drives stigma and prejudicial behavior. So how do we end the opioid crisis? Well, the answers are science and compassion. Because the good news is that opioid use is treatable, with outcomes as good or better than many other diseases that are life-threatening. Science tells us that today, the only evidence-based treatment available to treat opioid use disorder is medication. There are three FDA-approved medications to treat opioid use disorder. Naltrexone, buprenorphine, and methadone. In clinical trials, people treated with buprenorphine, for example, have symptom remission and begin their recovery in as little as three months, 50%. That type of outcome is, is just not possible without medication. And we need compassion. Compassion is more than feeling sorry for somebody. It is tolerating what we find uncomfortable, and it is acting. When someone is struggling, of course it is uncomfortable. The symptoms are ugly, and people with addiction make terrible mistakes. And it is terrifying to watch. Of course we want to turn away. But that often leaves the individual suffering entirely alone, without hope, or refuge at the very time they need us most. Sometimes I think that we've become so desensitized to suffering that we think we can't make a difference or that it is not our problem. Not my kid, not my problem. So how can you help end the opioid crisis? Stand up for science and treatment on demand. Talk to your legislators or your health care providers and ask them, what, what are you doing to help end the opioid crisis? Because they can make a difference. 
educate yourself. Step out of your comfort zone and find out why treatment makes recovery possible. And lastly, use your compassion. We need to talk about substance use and this problem in our country, particularly if you suspect someone is struggling or you are struggling yourself. No more pictures of dead children. Treatment saves lives. Every life is worth saving. Let's save lives. Thank you.